Kathy Tisdale. Uh, she was Fiona in uh, the musical, and she sang here, and it was just beautiful. So to everybody who participated, whether here or out back in the, uh, in the parlor, uh, it was just beautiful. So thank you very much to everyone who helped in the back of the area. So with no other announcements to be made, the prelude for this morning's worship is Adagio, commercial uh, 356 by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Listen for the unfamiliar voice that may be Christ calling. Listen for the voice that shares. 
shares hope and healing. Wonderful are the thoughts and the works of this God. His light is ready to shine in our hearts and in all the world. Praise be to God. Amen. And let us now join together in our unison prayer. Speak to us, O oh God, for your servants are yearning to listen. Amid the noisy clamoring for attention, our ears tingle at the prospect that you have a message for us. Here we are gathered so that you may search us and know us. We are wonderfully made in your image. Inspire us to live up to that image. Show us how to claim Jesus Christ in our daily decisions. We may witness to your love through deeds of kindness and words of inspiration. Amen. And now let us join together in singing the Lulu Hymnal number 393, One Bread, One Body. <laughs>
You're looking at the inside of the person. You're saying just because they don't have stuff, it doesn't mean that they're not good. It doesn't mean they're lazy. It doesn't mean anything else. It just means that they don't have stuff. And so by doing this, you're listening to James. You're listening to the fact that it doesn't matter how fancy we are on the outside. It matters how good we are on the inside. And so these gifts for people who don't have a lot of stuff, they mean that you understand what Christianity is all about. That we're looking at the inside of the person, and that's what Jesus wants us to do. So we're never to judge by how anybody looks on the outside. And that can be something even like skin color. It doesn't matter if you're black or yellow or white or polka dot. It doesn't matter. What Jesus looks at is inside. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. What Jesus looks at is on the inside. And so that's the message of James. That's part of the message of this food collection. And that's what you're going to talk about in Sunday school. So have a good Sunday school class. And, uh, and stay well, everybody. All right? Okay.
side effects. Also, we continue our prayers for uh, Jane Sheehan, who is undergoing cancer treatments of his own. Uh, please keep him and his wife, Marsha, uh, in your prayers. Also, um, I hope you do know, but in case you don't, I, uh, I apologize for just bringing this up like this, because uh, Sue Gilman is such an integral part of this church. Uh, but we also offer prayers for Sue Gilman, who was recently diagnosed with cancer um, as well. And Sue will be going out to uh, Boston tomorrow uh, for uh, diagnostic treatments, and, and uh, we're going to keep her in our prayers until she has completely defeated the cancer uh, that is now part of her life. Uh, so please keep Sue Gilman in your prayers. Also, <clears throat> we are having prayers at this time for a friend of mine, Bernice Vanish, who passed away this past Monday at the age of 95, whose funeral will be here on Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, I just want to tell you that I, I've been teaching Bible study since uh, April of 1988. Only one person in all those years of Bible study ever got a Star Student Award, and it was Bernice Manish. Uh, she would be there every time I had class, um, and every time she would be there before I was, she had all of these little three-ring binder notebooks, and she would keep every word I ever said in there, and she had, you know, if I forgot where I was, she had where we were. Uh, so Bernice Manish was my one and only uh, Star Student and she lived to the, the grand old age of 95, and so we will celebrate her life on Saturday at 11 o'clock. Are there any other joys or celebrations or concerns you'd like to share from the congregation? Not even going to give you a chance to drink water, are you? <laughs> All right, since there are none, uh, we would also like to take this opportunity of just a few moments of silence to you, Jesus, in the privacy of our own souls, and to feel his private words just for us. Jesus, when it came to helping others, you were even willing to face down the moral censure of your own neighbors. You were grieved when they insisted that God would not act for good and help a person in need because simply the time was wrong. Since you have revealed yourself in this way, we know that our prayers to you never go unheard. Let us trust in that promise as we have shared our prayers with you. Let us now join together in reciting the Lord's Prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We bring our offerings not to win Jesus' favor, but to express our gratitude to God. We give because we cannot truly live if we only take. It is our privilege to respond to Jesus' blessing upon us by sharing what we have with him and with those in need who help us to help him serve. Let us recognize that our offerings a recognition of all that Christ has given to us.
the people who you came to heal and to help through these gifts. We offer you our thanks for these offerings as we place them in your sanctuary, in your presence. Amen. And let us now join together in singing from the red handle number 288, let us break bread together. Jesus addressed the man with the shriveled hand. 
stand up here in front. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he said to him, Is it permitted to do a good deed on the Sabbath or an evil one, to preserve life or to destroy it? At this they remained silent. Jesus looked around at them with anger, for he was deeply grieved that they had closed their minds against him. And then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. The man did so, and his hand was perfectly restored. When the Pharisees went outside, they immediately began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. So every year this comes, and every year this is why I say I wish it would snow. I love winter. All this green stuff disappears. I'm, uh, I'm not good at not being well, so this, <clears throat> I don't like this. So anyway, do you remember the blue laws? I don't know if you're as old as I am, but I remember the blue laws. And uh, that's when all those businesses had to close on Sundays. I remember my parents, when I was a little kid, they had to go out on Saturdays to make sure that there was like bread or milk in the house because basically the stores were closed on Sundays. You know, I think to kids today, that practice has got to be almost inconceivable to them. It seems like on almost every corner, there's a convenience store that seems to be almost always open. And they, they could not possibly imagine having to go out on Saturday for bread or milk because you couldn't buy it anywhere. I remember going to church um, on Sunday mornings. My home parish was in Westfield on Main Street, and we didn't have a lot of parking. But we didn't need to have a lot of church parking because across the street there was a parking lot for businesses. They were all closed on Sunday, so their business parking lot became our church parking lot on Sundays because of those blue laws. And the Sabbath was behind all of these things. And none of us can remember this, but we belong to a church denomination that back in the day, they used to have members that would patrol up and down the aisles. And if somebody got a little bit too bored with the sermon, they had these nice long sticks and they would poke them in the side just to make sure that they would wake up and hear the word of God. You know, when I was a real young priest and the congregation was all facing this way, the choir wouldn't be seated here, they'd be seated at the back of the church. I'm a young kid. I started to preach. I barely got a few words out of my mouth. And this guy, who was the father of Sharon's dearest friend, he'd be up in the choir, and as soon as I said two words, he'd be going like this, pointing to his watch, like somebody did to me before church from the choir back here. So he'd be going like this, saying, that's a little bit too long. I hadn't even started, and he was telling me it was too long. Would I have ever loved to have sent that guy with the pole up there to give him a good shot at his side? But you didn't mess with the Sabbath. You paid attention to the Sabbath. But keeping the Sabbath now is a choice. It's not a law. And I think that makes it more meaningful. I'm not upset that the blue laws are gone because of religious reasons. I'm kind of sad that they're gone because people have to work on all of these Sundays and holidays. And it really is doing a job on family life. And so that's why I miss the blue laws. Not because they had to go to church, but because I feel bad for families. But there are no legal or social penalties for not paying attention to the Sabbath and trying to scare people into church on a Sunday. That just never resonated with me. First of all, I don't think it works. And second of all, I don't think it serves Jesus well. If I'm scared of what not going to church is all about, then that's more about self-preservation than having a real relationship with Jesus who loves me even more than I can imagine. So I don't really get into that idea of scaring people into church. But we are still called upon by God to keep holy the Sabbath day. So the question should be, why? And I think Jesus' words to us this morning are a good place to start answering that question of why the Sabbath. So before I do that, let me take a little sip. His disciples, they're walking along from one town to another so that Jesus can continue his ministry. And as they're walking along, they're picking the heads of grain. And I guess what you can do is you go like this and you can eat that grain. Now that is not stealing, uh, because according to Jewish law, landowners, they had to leave the, the, the fruit and the produce around the boundaries of their land 
there for the people to eat who couldn't afford um, to feed themselves. So it's this kind of idea here. And so before there was welfare, before there was social security, before there were food stamps, the landowners had to leave the, the edges of their fields for the poor people to be able to get something at least to eat. So that wasn't the problem. That wasn't when the disciples were breaking the law. The ones who are holders of the law, they never point out to the fact that the, the disciples were stealing. They accused them of breaking the Sabbath law. And when Jesus gives his answer, and then when Jesus himself works by healing on the Sabbath, by calling this man with a withered hand front and center in a place of worship in God's house, and he asks them, is it all right to heal and do good on the Sabbath? Well, when his answer to the Pharisees was so disturbing to them that after they left this place of God, they immediately began to conspire with the Herodians, the followers of King Herod. The Pharisees and the Herodians hate each other. Um, Herod was a Roman tool. He was the one that allowed the occupiers to have some semblance of Jewish authority. The Pharisees hated the Herodians. The Herodians hated the Pharisees. But they were willing to work together to take down Jesus. Oh, I wish it would snow. <laughs> so, what, what actually really upset these, these Pharisees was what Jesus said about the Sabbath. Because they felt that the Sabbath was sacred to God. And so it had to be um, God's way, the way they understood it. And Jesus kind of turned it around a little bit. And he so upset them that they were thinking about killing Jesus. And Jesus' words were, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. In other words, we don't need to look to heaven to understand the explanation of the Sabbath. We need to look around us. To put it bluntly, God don't need to rest every seven days. The Sabbath is for us. So Amy, she read the text of the Sabbath law right from the, the Old Testament book of law. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work. So let us try to imagine what a blessing the Sabbath must have been for the people of ancient Israel. And this is where I'm going to turn to another Yankee Candle story. Sometimes, as you know, they send me into the museum to cover for breaks. And in that room, there's a video of a colonial candle making that runs on a constantly repeating loop. And so I've heard the story a thousand times. And part of that video describes the life of young apprentices. The woman who works in the museum is one of the actors from that old video. And she told me that way back when, oh boy, losing my voice, I'm sorry. She told me way back when she goes to school, to high school, to pick up her son. Her son has no idea. He's expecting to go home. The woman gets the son, this teenage boy, into the car, and instead of going home, she tells him, we're going to Old Deerfield, and we're gonna make a candle-making video. So you can imagine how not happy this kid was, that he was gonna have to dress up in colonial gear to make a video about candle-making after high school class instead of going home. So when you see this video, you can see that the kid is not happy. I thought he wasn't happy because he was acting the job of an apprentice who I'm sure was not all smiles. He wasn't happy because he was a high school kid who wanted to go home instead of old Deerfield to make a candle making video. So anyway, these apprentices back in the day, they would work six days a week, probably 12 or more hours a day. They probably wouldn't have got any pay or maybe very little. At the end of the day, they would go upstairs, they'd have to sleep with the kids of the, of the owner. There was no privacy, there was no break, there was no respite. And then all of a sudden, every seventh day, the Sabbath came. There was a time to rest, there was a time to relax. And can you imagine how grateful those apprentices must have been every Sabbath day? And then take that and bring it back to ancient Israel, because it couldn't have been much different. They're working constantly to survive. And then on that Sabbath day, they can relax. They can take it easy. And so that's the kind of feeling that the Sabbath would have been for them. They must have so looked forward to it. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, the Sabbath was not made for God. The Sabbath was made for us. So it's not just the law against work in all of every circumstance, because that can begin to make the Sabbath not so much a gift to us. 
And God was not bothered by the disciples taking the grain and rubbing it as they walked along. God definitely was not upset when Jesus healed on the Sabbath, which was his work. Instead, God rejoiced in all of this. But something has snuck into the gift of Sabbath rest that is not at all what God intended. The Sabbath rest was supposed to be shared with God. It was never meant to be a rest from God. So on a beautiful Sunday like this, as people are riding bikes, as people are taking walks, as people are going on vacation, as people are heading to the beaches, as people are just enjoying maybe their outdoors with breakfast or going to breakfast somewhere, they've taken a rest from God. And God is wondering, why? What did I do? What is so horrible about me? What is so horrible about church that people need to take a rest from me? So I'd like to share with you a story. I think it's one of my favorites in, in the whole Bible. It's in the middle of the Exodus account. And it's a strange story, and I love it so. It's about a picnic with God. We don't think of God in those kind of terms. We almost think of God as being so other that we can't imagine this message of a picnic with God. But in the middle of the Exodus story, God is up on Mount Sinai. You know all those images of, of clouds and fire and thunder and lightning. So he's scared. But in this one little excerpt, an excerpt in Exodus, God comes a little bit down the mountain and he invites the leaders of Israel to come up the mountain. And while they're there, it says in the Bible, that they looked at God and they ate and they drank. They had a picnic with God. And this isn't me. This is the Bible saying that they had a picnic with God. I don't really know if that happened. But the story has got a meaning behind it that is so important that they could imagine God and the people of God having a picnic together. There was this familiarity with God that we have kind of lost that idea of being familiar with God. So the, rest, the Sabbath rest is never supposed to be a rest from God. It's not a chance to get away from church. It's a chance to get away from work so that we can relax with God. There are blessings and rewards that come from having a picnic with God. We do the Sabbath such a great injustice when we talk about church as an obligation. It has to be a joyous time together. It should be uplifting, it should be inspiring. It's not because of the music, it's not because of the words, it's not because of the space, it's not because of the people. It's because we're picnicking with God. It's the only place we're going to have that picnic with God. It is our time to relax, it is our time to be refreshed, and it is our time to be filled with only God can bring to the picnic. I love the watermelon we had at the picnic. Can you imagine the gift that God brings to the picnic? We give that all up when we forsake the Sabbath. I know I'm ordained. I know this is my job, my profession. But I love going to church. When I go away on vacation, I still go to church. I love church. And I hope each and every one of you does too. Because you don't have to be here. You've chosen to be here. And I'd like to close with a prayer that whatever we do as Hatfield Congregational, that it may help us and anyone else. And if you're watching on FCAP, that means you too. I hope, and oh, I mean, Hatfield Community Access Television too. I hope that you will come and join us as we picnic with God. Not because of a fear of hell if you don't go. Not because someone is poking you in the side because you fell asleep but because this is our place to be familiar with God, to sit down with Him, and to enjoy His presence. And that is the greatest reason of all, to keep holding the Sabbath day, the idea of picnicking with God. So let us, in that spirit of picnicking with God, prepare ourselves now to gather at really the Lord's table and to share the gift of Holy Communion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And I do believe in all of your bulletins you have the uh, communion insert. This table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. The Gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, on that same day sat at the table with two disciples, and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Women and men, youth and children, gather around on Christ's table. For this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God the Most High. We give you thanks, God, of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth, and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, and to suffer on the cross for us, be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit now in the church among us. With your daughters and sons of faith in all times and places, we praise you with joy by saying, Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory. O God most high, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, O Son in the highest. We remember that on the night of his betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
you in Christ's name and share with you bread. In the same way, <clears throat> Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, who may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Two bottles of water still worse. One communion cup, and I got my voice back. <laughs> May we now join together and sing the absolutely beautiful hymn, Shalom to you now, through hymnal number 436. <laughs> Thank you. 